I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of this land and pay their res my respects to the elders past and present. And I'd also like to thank Ramesh and the work of Jen Next and I'd like to endorse his comments about get onto the subscriptions and support, get onto the blogs, uh, support Jen Next in any way you can. It's one of the few organisations that is regularly presenting information about the mental health and well-being of our young people and thanks very much Ramesh. This is a serious topic but I want to talk about it in a constructive way. I'm not going to talk about it in any way that will shock you or depress you. I want you to engage in a solution should the terrible thing happen. And I want to acknowledge that there will be people in the room who have experienced suicide or who are close to suicide and I want to respect that, and I won't say anything that will jeopardise your safety. I'm talking about the topic because it's a serious problem. However, there are well-defined responses that schools have for critical incident management and the community increasingly and community agencies are an important part of that response and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But the key message I'm going to get across to you is critical incident management is not enough. The risk of the second suicide is ten times higher than the first and Good Grief has been working with headspace, school support, and we know around Australia at the moment are half a dozen cluster groups where more than three or four suicides have happened in 12 months. So effectively working after the first suicide is very important. The thing about it is you won't see it coming. It will shock and despair, cause shock and despair and horror in your community. As I said, these days we can't talk about a particular group and isolate the impact of a suicide to that group. It crosses schools because friendships cross schools. Kids are part of all sorts of groups, riding groups, horse groups, community groups, sporting groups, and through social media they have extended networks into other cities, other states. Sometimes schools find it hard to get together. In two sites at the moment where we are working with Headspace, it is the community worker who's bringing schools together and community groups and sporting groups. It's the council that's playing a significant role. Because social media tells us that the well-being of children is threatened by suicide, but it crosses all sorts of boundaries. It also crosses age groups. There are always older and younger siblings. There's always friends of older and younger siblings. Critical incident management tends to stop at the three month mark. Grief and the experience of grief lasts a lot longer than that. And if it's a close friendship, grief could pop up years later. Most people learn to manage grief, but many people, particularly in this circumstance, need support to cope with grief. And if grief is unresolved, we know that it can complicate a person's life and lead to big sources of anxiety and stress, particularly as the adolescents grow a bit older. A death by suicide causes many losses. The friends and the peer group feel those losses intensely. The most important group of people to adolescents, they will tell you, is their peer group, my friends, and that sense of that friendship. We know it comes down to the crunch, family's more important, 
but they will tell you on the surface how important their friends are. So they will feel these losses. And grief is a reaction to those losses. Adolescents experience grief after a death by suicide in more intense ways. They do struggle with meaning. They do struggle with anger. Unfortunately, we start also at this time to talk about suicide prevention. That can lead to guilt because people say, how come I missed that? And you shouldn't feel guilty for that because most of the time it shocks and surprises. We don't predict. There are sad cases where we know people are ill and they've been struggling, but most of the time, over 90% of the time, it shocks. Kids feel that. It can lead to guilt that can disenfranchise the expression of grief and drive it underground, and then it becomes dangerous. The other thing that can lead to disenfranchised grief is the car park narrative. Nobody can know why it happened. We just know that it did. And we just know that life has changed. What we have to do is help people cope with the change. Sometimes school communities, and the reason for my message, they've shut down their discussion and their recognition, but kids on social media are still very, very active. The young boy or girl who might have died by through suicide has a Facebook page that the kids are keeping alive. Every anniversary, activity on those Facebook pages spike. Schools and the communities can stop talking about grief, but the kids are meeting every month by the tree where the car accident happened or down by the river where the drowning occurred or whatever it happened to be because they're trying to remember and they're trying to make meaning. So what we have to do is normalise that response. And Seasons for Growth is a program I'm pleased to say can contribute to a positive outcome in that regard. And we've now done it several times in conjunction with Headspace School Support and we're getting very, very good results in helping people adjust to the fact and changing their behaviour. I got a letter only yesterday from a counsellor in a school she said, the kids did the program, they've come back this term, their behaviour is normal. And that's the whole goal of the program, is to normalise the experience of grief. Not deal with the issue of suicide as such, not focus on the event, but deal with how am I coping with grief. So in a small group, they can talk about their feelings of grief, they understand where they're feeling, it legitimises their feelings, it gives them a voice, and you can, through safe measures, start to talk about how to move forward. How can I be supported? How can I support myself? How can I support other people? How has this experience of grief become an integrated part of my life? Because grief never leaves you. How can I make it an integrated part of my life and then move on? Not move on in a way that forgets, but move on in a way where memories are retained and networks of support are built up. And it's in that conversation process that positive relationships are built, the experience is normalised, and they gain ongoing support. Here's the conversations that kids have. This is the things they write at the end of the program. I love it, Smick. I'd never heard of that word. That was a new one for me. Things will get better. Everyone copes differently. They're quite profound messages. This is what the people who worked with the group had to say. Notice the issue of safety. It's got to be paramount in a situation like this. So apart from my number one message, it's not over after three months. You need to look to support more. You need to attend to the grief in the community, amongst the parents, amongst the staff. There will be great differences. Some will be near, some will be far. And 
The third message is through experience and data, we know that seasons for growth can help. And recently I've been work working with Headspace and I see that another program can be helpful and I must add it to the slide, it's called the Friends Program and it's out of Melbourne. So there are things you can do constructively that can help in this situation. Thank you very much.